Order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister for Social Development, and we will start with list of questions. Members, question 13 and 14 have been withdrawn. I call Mr. Declan McAleer. Mr. McAleer. I'll get a cash over hand. Question one. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. The Supporting People Review final report included 13 recommendations for improvements to the efficiency and effectiveness of the Supporting People programme. My department has established an implementation steering group to drive the implementation of the 13 recommendations working with key partners. I will publish an action plan in March of this year setting out implementation skills for my own department and our delivery partners, including the Northern Ireland Housing Executive and the Department for Health, Social Services and Public Safety. My aim is to have the implementation pro process largely complete by March 2018. Mr. McAleer, for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, could the Minister um, detail or outline what measures this department will be taking to implement the recommendation of the Quality Commission report? Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, in keeping with all recommendations of the report, my department will apply itself to all of, of the recommendations and as far as within as lies, and I hope that's in totality, it will be implementing that aspect of it uh, completely. Well, Mrs Dolores Kelly for a question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Question two, Minister. The uh, Women's Centre Child Care Fund was introduced as a temporary emergency funding package pending the implementation of a coordinated child care strategy for Northern Ireland. It was established in April 2008 following on from the Children and Young People's Fund as part of an emergency departmental response to ensure child or key child care services provided in women's centres were kept open pending an executive decision about their future funding. The fund supports 14 women's centres across the region at a cost of approximately £850,000 per annum. My department stepped in over the last number of years to provide funding in a way that has ensured continued delivery of the Women's Centre Child Care Fund. I remain committed to that position. My predecessor, Minister Storey, indicated last year in terms of the budget process, that this would be the last year. However, given that we have an OFM DFM childcare strategy which, that will not come into operation until 2017, there is the issue of what we do in the interim. To this end, my officials recently published a bid for funds to DFP. However, unfortunately, this was rejected. This issue remains a priority for me. And I have to work now to ensure that we have a transition that, as far as possible, is not detrimental to the delivery of the, the service. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. I welcome uh, the Minister's commitment. Uh, but I think the people, women uh, uh, in particular, who are working in the sector and those who depend upon the service it provides would like some and would need some uh, surety and guarantee. Uh, we are, after all, in the month of February. People will be getting redundancy notices shortly. And uh, I'm sure the Minister would agree uh, that uh, the service provided promotes social inclusion, etc. So I wondered, in terms of exploring uh, other funding options, Given the Social Investment Fund has been unable to spend its money, might it uh, then be a source that the Minister could tap into to at least assure uh, the Women's uh, Centre's funding for the year ahead? Well, I thank uh, Ms Kelly for her question. And let me assure her that this is a matter that I am totally committed to. Now, she raises the issue of the Social Investment Fund, and I'm not quite sure whether, in fact, that can be applied there or not. But I can assure her of this, that no stone will be left unturned. And I do accept that she, what she says when she says that the staff are all on their exit notice. And I think that brings a degree of uncertainty. And it is my hope that I will be able to do or get gap funding. But at the moment, I can't give any guarantee except that I will do my best. And I hope in this instance, my best is good enough. Call Mrs. Paula Bradley. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers so far. I would be in agreement uh, with uh, Mrs. Kelly uh, uh, on, the, on the essential need that we have for, for some more information on this, and I welcome the Minister's commitment um, that he is going to try his utmost to, to secure this funding for the women's centres. But can I just ask him what his assessment would be of the work supported by the Women's Centre Child Care Fund? My department recently commissioned an evaluation of the Women's uh, Centre Child Care Fund, which has been an emergency measure since 2008, as I have said earlier. The evaluation concluded that the programme provided a wide range of positive impacts both in relation to the development and well-being of children and also in supporting parents to access services and opportunities. And can I also further state, before I come into the department, I was totally committed to this particular scheme. And now that I'm in a position to do something about it, I can assure the member and the previous member that has asked this question that this is something that we are going to move uh, well, not literally heaven and earth, but we're going to make strident moves to ensure that it does not collapse. Okay. Call Mr. Roy Beggs. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. <coughs> the, the Minister will be aware that childcare pro provides an essential service to enable many to move from welfare into employment, and that in many areas there actually may be under provision of care, childcare facilities. Would the Minister acknowledge? that the staff involved and the parents who are currently being supported will get little, little comfort with the thought that there is a strategy to be implemented in 2017 and what's going to happen before then? Well, I thought I maybe had answered that question, but let me say this, that the present scheme has been on an annual year-on-year -year funding from 2008. And, um, here we are now in the year 2016, and funding has been available. It is continuing, and I am very hopeful that I can continue this funding for a further year, and by then, we hopefully, the childcare strategy will have kicked in. But that will be a new situation, and that will be for the minister at that particular time. But I am determined that 2016-17 will be funded, and I hope I haven't overstated that. Mr. Jerry Kelly for a question. Three. Question three, please. First and foremost, I'd like to confirm my department's ongoing commitment to the delivery of the agreed master plan conceptual framework in its entirety. My department is currently finalising the site infrastructure at Girdwood Park, which has facilitated the delivery by Belfast City Council of its flagship community hub and the provision by Apex Housing Association of some 66 new houses. As the member will be aware, the department's infrastructure provides project includes the provision of a new multi-sports pitch. My officials have already been engaging with other statutory bodies and stakeholders in the wider community to take forward important preparatory work for an indoor sports facility and mixed-use economic facilities. Delivery of these elements of the master plan conceptual framework will, of course, be subject to satisfactory business cases and the availability of budget. I am pleased to note that the Belfast City Council has set aside £6 million for the development of the indoor sports site, and I am confident with cross-party support the Executive will be able to commence the next phase of delivery in the spending review period beginning in April 2017. Call Mr. Kelly for supplement. Uh, I thank the Minister for his uh, answer up tonight and his commitment that uh, the Department is still uh, committed to the entire uh, project. I wonder whether you have any uh, comment on uh, the departmental engagement with the local communities in terms of the management of the, the facilities uh, uh, into the future? Well, can I say, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, that my department is currently investing some £6 million in essential infrastructure and indoor, including roads, services, landscaping, and including a synthetic pitch to support the wider development at Girdwood Park. This is in line with the agreed conceptual de development framework. This work is scheduled to be complete 
by March 2016. Their infrastructure works will support the Belfast City Council Community Hub, which recently opened new social housing units by Apex Housing Association, which are due to be available around May 2016, and the future development of the remaining sites. Mr. Sidney Anderson. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for his, uh, his answer so far. Uh, you may have been touched on, but what future plans, Minister, are there for future housing development for the Gurdwood site? In line with the uh, agreed conceptual framework, an area of land along uh, Clifton Park Avenue has been identified for housing. The site is currently not listed for development due to lack of demand. Following the allocation of social housing scheme on the nearby Old Park Road by Choice Housing Association, demand in the area will be reviewed in the coming months. It is envisaged that affordable homes will be delivered on this site. Mr. Alban McGuinness. Could I thank the Minister for his uh, reply, interesting reply, uh, and could I congratulate the Minister on his appointment? Um, I, I did work with him before in various different guises, and I, I know he brings a lot uh, to this position. But in relation to housing on the Gerwood site, which has, uh, as you know, uh, been uh, a contentious issue, the review that the Department intends to undertake in relation to housing, how soon will that review take place? And what progress does the Minister feel that there might be made in terms of augmenting uh, the proposals for housing on the site? I would like to thank the member for his comments. And as I'm aware that he is not, it's not his intention to return to this assembly, I would wish him all the best in the future too, wherever the future takes him. In relation to the future of this site, I have to say, and I'm sure he will readily agree with me, that this has been a matter for some debate and discussion over recent times. It has still some distance to go, but my department is totally committed to the development of the site and the review, and I hope to be in a position to come back very soon, or whoever is the minister then should be coming back to this, certainly within this calendar year. Call Mrs. Sander over the end. Question number four, please. The decision to transfer regeneration and community development powers to the local government ultimately rests with the executive. The new Department for Communities will have a much wider range of responsibilities. In this context, it would be prudent to wait until the new functions have been assimilated in the DFC and then the executive can determine when any of those responsibilities would best be delivered at a local level. The timing would be subject to the successful completion of the legislative process. The fundamental aim of the reform programme remains the same, to transform local government. Putting decision-making on local matters in the hands of locally elected representatives. Ultimately, the executive will decide the way forward in the context of the newly formed Department for Communities. Call Mrs. Overend for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for, for his response. But I wonder will the Minister agree with me that while there is ambiguity as to the timescale of the, the transfer of these powers to your local councils, they will remain in, in some sort of limbo and uh, that there should be some sort of commitment to a timescale of the transfer of these powers within the programme for government? Well, I do agree with the sentiments expressed by the uh, member that it is important that the uncertainty is dealt with as, as quickly as possible. And I do accept that it is important that we come to this situation as, as humanly, quickly as humanly possible. Now, we had hoped that we would be coming in 2016, but the truth of the matter is we'll not be. However, we can look then to 2017, and hopefully we will be. But can I assure the member that I and my party are totally committed to this, and uh, we will be making every effort to ensure that it happens in as short a time scale as possible. Mr. Gregory Campbell. 
Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, could the Minister outline uh, that the important duties that will be transferred across, uh, and they are important duties, uh, that the resources that, would, or, that were originally envisaged to be allocated to the local authorities will actually be reflected in reality? Well, can I say to the member that councillors have been advised of budgets anticipated to transfer them? Should the regeneration bill have successfully completed this legislative passage? Unfortunately, we know that will not be the case. However, as this is no longer the case, there will be no specific allocation to councils to deliver services to tackle deprivation in 2016. That responsibility remains with my department. Well, Mrs. Karen McKevitt. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and can I uh, congratulate the, the Minister? It's my first opportunity to do so uh, on his new position. Um, can I ask the Minister, um, Mr. Campbell's already touched on about the resources, but the budget for the delivery um, of this function, uh, will it also transfer uh, to local government? And what guidance is his department uh, given to look at, uh, and discussions is he having with local government in order for them to be ready? And I thank the member too for her kind remarks and her well wishes in, in, to me in the future in this department. Yes, I think that uh, there would be something very amiss if there was not the budget was transferred at the same time. There has to be. Otherwise, it will not be an effective uh, form of government. And uh, given that the executive has only recently agreed the final budget for 16-17, I now need to consider the impact the settlement will have across the remit of my department. But yes, the budget is a very important factor. If it doesn't go with it, then why should it transfer at all? Mr. Chris Little for a question. Question number five. Through its community support programme, my department provides £1.6 million of funding to frontline advice services each year. This is supplemented by approximately £1.9 million from local councils who then commission frontline advice centres for their local areas. Additionally, my department provides funding of £1.3 million annually for regional support services for frontline advisors. Budget allocation for 2016-17 year has not yet been agreed. Mr. Little for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for his answer, and I ask him would he agree that uh, independent advice service provide a, a vital assistance to ensure that people in our community receive the social security assistance to which they are fully entitled. In my own constituency, East Belfast Independent Advice Centre works on a shoestring budget of £70,000 per year and brings in multi-million pounds worth of, of savings uh, to which people are fully entitled. Could I ask the Minister, therefore, if he would be uh, willing to follow up a commitment given by uh, his predecessor to meet with the Northern Ireland Independent Advice Service uh, uh, sector and myself in relation to ensuring that the advice centres have adequate resources to achieve what they are able to achieve. Well, uh, Mr Little uh, talks about the uh, advice centres having limited resources. And uh, I can rub thumbs with them on that too. I have a finite budget also. And, uh, however, I am quite prepared to uh, meet with you and those who provide the service to discuss the issue uh, in the future. And as Mr. Storey has given, already given that commitment, I'm prepared to stand by that commitment. Call Mr. Jared Diver. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister if the recommendations from the recent uh, Everson panel regarding funding for advice uh, centres will be implemented in full and that people can have assurances that they will have high standard advice on an ongoing basis? Can I, can I thank the member for his question and I also wish him well uh, in his recent uh, coming into the, to the Assembly here in place of, I think it was Mr. Ramsey. The uh, Professor Everson's report recommended additional funding for frontline advice services of £1.25 million per annum for four years. The, the Executive has now agreed the implementation of the recommendations, and I have asked my officials to consider how best the recommendations are to be taken forward. Well, Mrs. Pam Cameron. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister uh, for his answers thus far, and also welcome him to his new role as Minister of uh, DSD. Can I ask him when the funding for frontline um, advice services will be confirmed? Can I thank my colleague uh, Pam Cameron for her uh, well wishes too, but the budget allocations for 2016 17 have not yet been agreed. Frontline advice providers and local councils will be advised as, as soon as is humanly possible. Call Ms. Rosie McCarley. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers thus far. And can I also congratulate the Minister on his uh, future, his new role? Uh, I, I was asking, uh, all, along with other people, intending to ask the Minister about the additional resources, and he's already answered that. So, can I ask the Minister then just how confident is he that vulnerable people will be well served in the new arrangements? Well, can I thank the member for her well wishes? And uh, yes, uh, let me say this: uh, as far as attending and, and looking after and providing a service for vulnerable people, I believe that society does owe it to them. And as one who has uh, an advice centre, like many others uh, in this chamber. Uh, we deal with those sort of issues virtually on a daily basis, and they are very close to my heart. And if it's down to me to do it, I can assure you it will be done, and there wouldn't be no gap in that service. Well, Mr. Adrian McQuillan for a question. The Housing Executive has 4,444 properties in the East London area constituency area which all meet the standard. All meet the standard. Mr McQuillan for a supplementary. Can I thank the, the Minister for his answer and also congratulate him on his elevation to the front line, the benches. What investment is being made in, East, in the housing sector properties in East London Dairy, Minister? Can I thank Mr McQuillan for his well wishes? I suspect this honeymoon period will end <laughs> so, sometime, but, but uh, I, I so. I'll enjoy it while it's uh, happening. In line with the in interim investment plan, the Northern Ireland Housing Executive has five schemes either already underway or planned to commence in the next year in East Londonderry, worth a total investment of approximately $1.483 million. Further necessary investment has been made in properties in East Londonderry and continues to be made through planned and response maintenance, with around £21 million committed to schemes during the last two and a half years. Uh, Mr Chris Hazard is not in East Place. I call Mr Datty Mackay. Up to question number eight. <clears throat> My department is continuing to work with the Equality Commission for Northern Ireland to take forward the four recommendations that were made as a result of its investigation. The the breaches related to the Department's 2001 Equality Scheme, no breaches were identified against the current Equality Scheme. As recently as 22nd of January, a meeting was held with representatives from the Equality Commission to ensure the Department was addressing the concerns raised. On a general note, my Department adheres to its Equality Scheme and received positive feedback from the Equality Commission on our Section 75 Annual Progress Report, which set out the work undertaken to meet our equality obligations in 2014-15. I call Mr Mackay for supplementary. Mr Mackay, the last time, can I also congratulate the Minister on his appointment? Um, can I ask the Minister uh, if he is satisfied that the current legislative and policy framework on procurement of housing support services in relation to supporting people, uh, does he believe that that is delivering the required outcomes? I thank the member for his well wishes too. He has asked a very direct question. He has asked me, am I satisfied? And the answer is as direct I can say, yes. Call Mr Sammy Douglas for supplement. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, thank the Minister for his answer so far. Could the Minister outline the current position of the Department's equality scheme uh, work and the work on the housing strategy? The Department has published the final version of the housing strategy alongside a mid-term update 
on the 33 actions in the Housing Strategy Action Plan and an updated equality screening. The mid-term update shows that a total 27 screenings have been completed to date. That the Action Plan update shows that the strategy is delivering on its vision to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to access, access good quality housing at a reasonable cost. Well, Mr. Jared Diver for a question. Question nine, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I say to the member, I've just approved the Housing Executive's new social housing development programme for the three-year period 2016-17 to 2018-19. Budget for the 16-17 social housing development programme and beyond have yet to be agreed. However, the Housing Executive has based its indicative programme for 2016-20 on delivering 8,000 new starts over this period. In terms of affordable housing, the Northern Ireland Co-Ownership Housing Association continues to be my department's main delivery partner. My department has secured nearly £95 million of financial transaction capital loan funding for the co-ownership scheme for the period 2015 to 2018-19. It is anticipated that this funding, in conjunction with its private funding, will permit Northern Ireland Housing Executive to deliver over 2,600 additional affordable homes across Northern Ireland. Call Mr. Dever for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his uh, assurances? I think anybody on the housing list will welcome the fact that we are getting new homes built. Can I ask the Minister, uh, in relation to the debate and the consultation uh, around potentially housing associations uh, acquiring uh, former housing executive properties going forward, uh, can current housing executive tenants be assured that they won't be in any way detrimentally affected by that process or by that change if there is such a policy decision? Mr. Speaker, I, I, I want to be fair to the questionnaire here and, and, and say to him that this is one that I want to look at before I give a definitive answer. I think I'm telling you right when I say it is the case. However, I will come back to you on that and provide you a full answer because I recognise that it is an important issue, and not only for the members in here, but in fact for tenants and those who are hoping one day to, to buy their own home. So I will come back to you on that one. Thank you. Call Mr George Robinson. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Deputy Speaker, could I con congratulate uh, the Minister on his elevation to his new post and ask him how his housing need calculated? Uh, can I thank the member for his well wishes too? And uh, it's good that there are so many right round the house who are wishing me well. And I hope that in the uh, months to come, it'll be that way also. That whenever there may be something that I haven't delivered for them in their own area, they're still uh, prepared to wish me well. Uh, but I suspect that that might uh, not be the case. The housing executive, uh, the. Uh, the weight, how are they calculated? This is done through a process. And can I say to the member that as one who has been a long-time councillor in his own area, as I was in mine, uh, this is always a subject that keeps coming up. But I can assure the member that there is a very fulsome and robust uh, method to determine how th this is done. And I will send the member on the exact details of it, and I think he will be convinced, as I am convinced, that it is a true and trusted method to ensure that there is a fairness and equality in the whole scheme. Thank you. Call Mr. Uh, Phil Flanning for a very short supplementary. I got the, for your last question, Corey, I'll uh, dispose with wishing the, the minister well, and if, if that's your intention, um, can, the, can the minister provide us with an update as to how his department and the housing executive um, are trying to overcome the barriers faced by people trying to develop social and affordable housing in rural places like Edirne and Fermanagh, uh, where the wastewater treatment plants are full and no further development can then be connected? And I genuinely do wish the minister well. Any joking? Well, I thank the member for his well wishes too. And uh, I must say that uh, he raises an issue in relation to rural areas, which I too have a concern about. 
I'm not sure whether he was at the latest uh, development in Five Mile Town the other day or not, where we have an upgrade of the sewage treatment works. And uh, I think that those are the sort of schemes that we want to see being developed because I, I do accept that the infrastructure in some of the areas is prohibiting the development, in, in particular in rural areas. If, however, he has an area, and he mentions Edirne, if that is one that is of great concern to him, if he contacts my office, I will look at that one in person and see just what the situation and how we can take it forward to ensure that homes are provided for rural communities. Because rural communities are as much entitled to homes as those who live in urban areas. I'm sure it's superfluous for me to assure the Minister I did not wish to deprive him of good wishes. The time, the time is simply up for uh, listed questions, and we will now move on to topical questions. Topical question one has been withdrawn, and I call Mr. Gordon Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I too welcome the new minister. Thank him for his recent visit to North Down, and we're looking from for, from him a lot of good things. <laughs> Can I? Good evening. Is there a question somewhere? There is a question, yes. Good evening. At least one. Can I ask the minister? <laughs> Can I ask the Minister for an update on the regeneration of Bangor Town Centre, including the long-awaited Queen's Parade? And we do recognise the work to date by DSD in the Town Centre. Well, can I thank Mr Dunder again for his well wishes? And he's right, I did spend a very good day in Bangor last Thursday. And uh, it was good to see the sparkle back in Bangor. And something that I said at that day that I thought uh, in earlier years has been missing. But in re relation to the question that I asked, could I say that over the last three years, my officials have been working in partnership with the Council Design, develop and deliver a major £8 million public realm improvement scheme for Bangor. Significant progress has been made to the works programme, and the works are due to be complete three months earlier than expected. It's not often Mr. Deputy Speaker, you hear that. But it's expected to be completed by the 31st of March 2016. And during my recent visit to Bangor to officially open the YMCA's new premises in High Street, I've seen for myself how this substantial investment in Bangor is already beginning to inject renewed vibrancy into the town centre, making it a modern place to visit and spend time in. In relation to Queen's Parade, significant progress has been made since my department stepped in and took direct control of the scheme. In March 2015, my department attained planning approval for a scheme that would provide for an excess of 25,000 square metres of floor space. The new development includes a mix of residential, retail, commercial uh, and hotel accommodation, restaurants, cafes, a courtyard plaza and public open space for marine gardens. These plans will complement the public realm works and restore this area into an attractive, vibrant, inclusive place for everyone to enjoy and enhance the reputation of the town as a key tourist, tourist and shopping destination. And Mr. Dunn for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I am assured that that visit has already paid off, but uh, can the minister give us some? Um, clarification on the actual start date for the Queen's Parade, and we would prefer it in writing, Mr Minister. This project has gone on so long, we would like to see work on site as soon as possible. Well, I don't know about the writing aspect, but I suspect whatever I say here now will go down in Hansard. So that, whether that's enough to satisfy the member or not, I'm not quite sure. But the, the granting of planning permission in March 2015 was a key step in the development process. The next major step is to complete site assembly. The majority of the property is now in the ownership of DSD. My officials have been negotiating with the three remaining property owners for over 12 months to achieve agreement by mutual consent. I don't know whether the member can assist us with that or not. Negotiations are ongoing. However, it is unlikely that agreement will be reached for all the properties, and the department has issued notices of intention to vest the remaining properties properties owners. My department has also requested a public inquiry into the decision to adopt 
a development scheme for Queen's Parade and the issue of vesting notices, and this is set for the 3rd of February 2016. A final decision on the making and acting of the vesting order will be made following the public inquiry. My department, in conjunction with Council, are working closely together and hope to appoint a private sector develop development partner in September 2016 to take forward the proposals. It is estimated that the groundwork will commence around 12 to 18 months after the appointment of the developer. I call Mr. Adrian Cochran Watson, who has just got to his place. Is this topical? Question number two. Uh, speaker, I've been away all morning on hospital appointment. My apologies, don't have a question. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Could I ask the Minister what action his department is taking uh, to deal with uh, housing benefit fraud and what progress has been made in relation to that? Mr Deputy Speaker, can I just say to the member that uh, the issue of fraud, whether it's housing, or it's social welfare or whatever, is an issue that I take very seriously and my department takes it very seriously and I think every MLA in this House should take it seriously. And I can assure the member who has asked the question that it is very high on our list of priorities because Whatever is taken away in fraud, there is less to go to those who really deserve it. And I want to assure the member that, like him, I too am concerned about the scale of fraud. Whether that's at a low or a high level, it has to be tackled, and I can assure him it will be tackled. Call Mr Lyons for supplementary. Uh, thank you. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the uh, Minister for his answer so far. Um, this is an issue, uh, or a specific case was brought to my attention, uh, of a resident uh, of, the, of a housing executive property who uh, abandoned the property, continued to claim housing benefit, um, but left her dog within that property, uh, and the dog was left to starve to death. Um, that is obviously not acceptable on a number uh, of levels. Can the Minister assure me that his department will take all action um, that he is able to take uh, in order to ensure that those uh, people who are claiming housing benefit are entitled to it uh, and that the department will continue to invest uh, in actions so that action can be taken against housing benefit? Because as the Minister rightly says, um, any welfare money that is spent uh, to those who don't need it is taken away from those who do. I thank the member for his question, and quite frankly, I find that the story that he has related here today quite horrendous, absolutely horrendous. And would I say to him and to everyone else that's within the sound of my voice today, if they are aware of any of this sort of behaviour going on, we all have a moral and a civic responsibility to report that to the authorities to ensure that that sort of stuff is stamped out immediately. In relation to fraud itself, the estimated level of benefit fraud has reduced from £60.9 million of public money back in 2001. And it was in 2001 when I took up the conversation, when I was last time in uh, DSD, it's to an estimated £25.2 million today, in 2014 rather, with a further estimated £18.4 million lost through housing benefit fraud. And my department has a dedicated team of fraud investigators who work right across Northern Ireland. So there is no let up on that, Mr Lyons, I can assure you. And uh, back to the incident that you reported, I think that's horrendous. And if you have any information that can help my department or the police, then please speak to us. Well, Mr Jerry Kelly for a topical question. I'll ask on Corleon and continuance of the Wong Glow around yourself. Minister, I also uh, add my best wishes to you in uh, your responsibilities in the department. Uh, the department has announced uh, a review into the uh, regulation of the uh, private rented sector, and I wonder would the minister give us some 
um, detail of what areas it will cover in terms of that review. Thank the member for his well wishes. And could I say, in relation to the review that he speaks about, this will be a very comprehensive review. It will take in all aspects of it. And if there are areas that the member has a concern about or he feels that he could feed into and would like to see considered, then we are ready to listen to him and hear what he has to say on this issue. Good. Mr Kelly for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for his answer up to now and indeed his offer to, uh, to feed into that. Uh, I thank him for that as well. I, I suppose the one thing that I would mention is that uh, in terms of uh, some assurances around the fact, and he did say it was going to be comprehensive, that the anti-social issue uh, is looked at as well. As he knows, in the uh, social uh, uh, housing sector, there are some regulations and ability to deal with this uh, when it happens which at times, perhaps not often, but at times can destroy a whole uh, street or, or area. Uh, and I, if we can look at that in terms of the private sector, that would be very helpful. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, uh, anti-social behaviour constantly comes up as one of the big issues that uh, public representatives are getting through their door of complaints virtually on a daily basis. And it is something that... Uh, I think that the message still doesn't seem to have got out that this antisocial behaviour is in some way acceptable in this age. And I'd like to make it very clear, as far as I am concerned, my department, antisocial behaviour has to be tackled head on. And sometimes that means putting our heads above the parapet. But that has to be done. And I will ensure that in this review, which, as I have already said, will be comprehensive, that antisocial behaviour will be one of the issues that will be looked at from every angle to see how it can be reduced, indeed better, if it can be stamped out altogether. Mr. Martin, I'm here for a topical question. I'd like to congratulate the Minister also on his appointment. And I hope your predecessor tells me he left a little note that to deal sympathetically with my questions. I hope you received that note, Minister. I want to bring you back to an issue which you will remember from your last uh, stint in this post, and that's the Holy Lands. Uh, our efforts, continuing efforts, to try and make it a family-friendly, vibrant community. Uh, and Minister, as you know, the city is now changing. There may be up to 4,000, 5,000 purpose-built units for students coming on stream. And I wonder if you consider revisiting our efforts to regenerate the Holy Land as a vibrant community. Um, I didn't understand the first part of the member's question. But I did uh, take from him that it was well wishes too. I must say the one thing that has struck me since I was the, since the first minister appointed me uh, to this department, the number of people that remembers me there. I thought there was nobody still living uh, that remembers me there. It's that long, long ago. But now that you speak about the Holy Lands, I do remember, and I can have some uh, memories of that. However, I don't remember the details, to be truthful. And I think that if I'm going to come up to speed on that one again, that you should uh, bring that to my attention, and we certainly will have a look at it. But I have listened to it in the news in the past, and I know there are some quite unsavoury things that have been going on there, and those things need to be looked at and need to be tackled. Okay. Mr. Muller for supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Minister, for your response. And I didn't mean to spring that on you. Um, I suppose why it's topical is because St Patrick's Day is coming around, and you know that's, you'll, you'll remember that's always a very tough time for the, the families and residents of uh, the Holy Land. Uh, perhaps, Minister, in the, in the time remaining between now and, and the uh, Parliament breaking up, I could invite you to, to come back to the Holy Land, maybe when you're doing a visit to South Belfast, and meet with some of the residents. But I suppose, in short, Minister, uh, I presume you would agree, and you would, you would like to see a uh, a, a community which is vibrant, family friendly, and which does not have the type of uh, anti social behaviour we have seen on St Patrick's Day in previous years? Yes, I think it would be very good if we could avoid what has been happening in, on St Patrick's Day in previous years. I'm, I'm not sure whether I can be there before St Patrick's Day, and I suspect even I was there, it may not totally influence what's going on or what might go on. Suffice to say that let's hope that the behaviour that has been witnessed there in the past is not a feature this year, and that, in fact, people show respect and regard for others. Thank you. 
Mr. Paul, through. Mr. Speaker, can I ask the Minister, in my constituents of North Huntland, there have been massive delays in maintenance and capital schemes by the Housing Executive over the last number of years, some delays lasting for over a year and a half and counting, some particular areas in Ballykeel uh, and Harrieville with regards to roofing schemes, and then some uh, external works in Cullybacky and in Bellamina North. Could I ask the Minister, is this unique to my constituency, and will he investigate these delays? Well, Deputy Speaker, can I say to the member that I don't think they are unique to North Antrim. Having said that, that's not saying that they're on a par with everywhere else. However, if the member wants to come and talk to me about that, or write to me, or send a question in about it, I want to get a look at it and see exactly what is going on in relation to North Antrim, the constituency that he cherishes so much. And if there is something unique about the delays in North Antrim, then we will take action to change that. Our time is up. And could I remind members, please, keep your questions short, and then perhaps more people will have an opportunity to ask questions.